security for me. Um, we do so because we believe in the power of debating to improve students' ability to think and to communicate. And this explains why the CEOs debate, progr debate program sponsors things like the middle school public debate program uh, and the McLaughlin debate in initiative. Um, but even those efforts don't explain our enthusiasm for free expression. Our support for free expression is grounded in many of the same reasons that it receives enthusiastic support in the broader project of liberal democracy. It is because it performs for us an epistemic function. It helps us find truth. In the current issue of National Affairs, Jonathan Roche discusses what he calls the constitution of knowledge, the general agreement on the means by which we determine our reality. We do so, Roche argues, by relying on enlightenment values. Propositions about truth lead to the exchange of perspectives in which the forces of persuasion evaluated by rational standards establish that which is most likely true. All have the right to contribute to this discussion, but that right corresponds with the responsibility of due, due diligence in evaluating the ideas exchanged. But the very proposition of enlightenment values, that, or the very proposition that enlightenment values are beyond reproach, should not itself be beyond reproach. We know that speech has consequences. We know that those consequences fall more heavily on certain sectors of society. And we know that those sectors, as a result of historic marginalization, do not have equal standing on the stages on which we debate these matters. Do we not have a duty to respect, to protect, and to project these voices so that their contributions to the conversations can be heard? These are the questions that bring us here today. How do we balance these competing interests? We hope that our efforts in this debate will shed some light on those questions. So we'll contest this motion in the tradition that we take for all of our public debates, with a proposition team arguing on behalf of the motion that the future of American democracy depends on free speech, and an opposition team arguing against it. Given the focus on free expression on campus that today's event features, we will direct our attention particularly to the question of what role free expression should play at the university. Each of these speakers will receive one seven-minute speech to make their best argument for and against it, beginning with a speech from the proposition and then alternating back and forth between the proposition and the opposition until all four speakers have been heard. During their speeches, their, their opponents will have the opportunity to interrupt their speeches with something called a point of information. This is a formality of British parliamentary style debating, the style in which the UAA team competes, that allows opponents to question the speaker during his or her speech. So after the first minute and before the last minute of each of those seven minute speeches, you're going to hear a bell. It sounds like this. That bell is going to indicate to the debaters that they now may offer a point of information or if it's the last minute, may no longer offer a point of information. Points of information are brief interruptions, a short question, a truncated argument that challenges something the speaker is saying in the moment. But it's entirely at the discretion of the speaker holding the floor whether or not those points of information are entertained. So you might see opportunities being asked for by the opponents, but that the primary speaker sits them down or says, not at this time. Don't think they're being rude. Part of what they're expected to do is to manage that time appropriately so that they have the opportunity to continue on with their thought before it's convenient for them or strategically opportune for them to take that point of information. Once the speaker has asked that question, then they sit back down the primary speaker returns with his or her message and answers or addresses that argument in the flow of their ongoing discourse. On the screen behind me, you'll notice an opportunity for you to vote. The way that we manage our public debates is to do a pre-debate and a post-debate poll of the audience's opinion. So before the debate begins, we'd like you to take out your cell phones and to send a text to that number up there, 37607. The body of the text should contain one of the three codes that corresponds with whether you agree with, disagree with, or prefer at this point to remain neutral on the question of whether or not the future of American democracy depends upon restricting free speech. Once the debate begins, we'll close that poll, give you a chance to listen to the arguments exchanged by the debaters, and then at the conclusion of the debate, we'll reopen a second poll that'll capture your sentiments at the end of the debate. We'll award the win to the proposition or the opposition based upon who caused the most change in the audience's attitude based upon the arguments that they've made. So if you haven't yet done so, go ahead and vote now. And once you've done that voting, take a second to silence your cell phones. It's always a good idea to have those in such a mode that they won't interrupt the speakers during their presentations. A couple of quick reminders. A reminder that particularly debaters in the contest of academic debate don't speak from a place of their personal conviction. 
Debating is an academic exercise in which we try to vigorously represent the positions assigned to us. These debaters did not have a choice of the topic or the side that they were going to represent today. Those, like any competitive round, were assigned to them. Their responsibility is to muster the best possible arguments they can for and against the proposition. The reason that I tell you that is I really want to avoid any of them getting pigeonholed into a particular ideology or cornered in the lobby after the debate with somebody pointing at them and accusing them of being so incredibly wrong, how could they possibly be a moral human being having that perspective? Keep in mind that they very, very much disagree with what it is they're saying at a personal level, but the opportunity of debate is that exercise in making the best quality arguments that you can. At this point now, I'd like to introduce our teams arguing on behalf of the proposition uh, this morning are going to be Genevieve Mina, who is a senior in biology and political science, and she's partnering with Robert Hakama, a junior in international relations. <laughs> the opponents to the motion this morning will be Haley Cabot, who is a senior in history. She'll partner with John Macy, who is a senior in philosophy. And at this point now, I would like to turn the debate over to them, call the House to order, and ask the audience to consider the proposition before us that the future of American democracy depends upon restricting free speech. Hear, hear. There is a difference between entertaining an opinion you strongly oppose and permitting a culture of casual brutality. The former is the lifeblood of democracy and the latter is a danger to a civil society. Here at the University of Alaska, we come from a variety of different backgrounds and we strive to create a space for education and for that civil society. That's why on our side of the house, we believe that the future of American democracy depends on restricting free speech. First, what I'm going to do in my speech is give you a model for the parameters of what this debate would be, then give you framing for how this debate is going to look like, and finally, two constructive arguments. But first, on the model. First, we're going to, within this debate, we will test this motion within the realms of academia, specifically on colleges and universities. Secondarily, what we're talking about is protecting students from offense within class or outside of class. What does this look like? Formally, it looks like speech codes, so whether there are rules and regulations about preemptively preventing offensive or hate speech. And additionally, this means trigger warnings. So when a professor is talking about some sort of subject that may be harmful, perhaps suicide or some sort of assault, a trigger warning is um, provided before that class starts. Additionally, uh, this types of limitations also results in informal examples, perhaps deplatforming, where there are no platform boycotts where students and organizations boycott and literally prevent speakers who are invited onto campus from being able to have a platform for that speech. This also looks like safe spaces. No, thank you. In terms of the framing, what this debate is essentially about is talking about how efforts to protect marginalized individuals from hate speech is tolerable within the marketplace of ideas. It's not just going to be talking about the First Amendment and how that's all great. In opposition, if they're going to try and make their argument specifically about the First Amendment, they're going to lose. But this debate is normative, and it's talking about whether it's tolerable to, expect, to uh, tolerate these types of ideas. So what am I going to talk about? First, the duty of the university, and second, why absolute free speech threatens students before that. So with this speech code, are we going to have lists of content that professors are not allowed to teach in their classrooms? Um, if that is what a university like thinks is beneficial towards promoting their goals of academia, then sure, we're fine by that. So going on, first, the duty of the university. I want to talk about three things under here. First of all, the presumption of free speech. We understand that in America, particularly, we love free speech and we love the ability for us to say whatever we want. Why is that? Because within free speech, we have an equality of ideas and we believe that no matter who you are, like the idea that you have talking in a public space is going to be helpful. But we do understand additionally that public discourse has many different arenas where ideas aren't necessarily equal. For example, if you're going into the doctor's office and the doctor tells you like something that ex is extremely radical and isn't going to help you in your disease, we think that we probably have a right to sue that doctor for malpractice. Why is that? Because there are certain authority figures that are being held accountable for what ideas they're espoused. Additionally, we believe that universities are not the same as a public 
public space. And within public spaces, we understand that government doesn't have a right to limit certain types of speech. However, in universities, they're completely different. So the second thing that I want to talk about then is why universities are different. No, thank you. First of all, we think that universities are different because their mission isn't necessarily an absolute right of free speech, but it's promoting education. What um, Jim Johnson just talked about is how the university's mission, I wrote this down, was to serve Alaska's needs for higher education. We see this in terms of regulation, like protecting students to create a safe learning environment. Things like anti-discrimination laws, Title IX, these are all different rules that we create for so students can feel safe, so they can adequately learn in their classrooms and in the campus that they can live on. But additionally, the last thing I want to talk about in the duty of the university is why academic freedom then is prioritized over this freedom of speech. Well, first of all, when we're talking about freedom of speech, the goal of freedom of speech is this equality of ideas. And the purpose for that equality is this concept of self-government. And we understand that. But when we're talking about the right of academic freedom, this is a specific right to teach uh, specific ideas that benefit those students, to promote research that benefit academia, and to create new ideas and cultivate that. The reason why universities rely on academic freedom over free speech is because academic academic freedom directly uh, results in that goal of trying to create a better educational environment and to create students that are going to graduate eventually um, into this world. The universities limit content based on academic freedom. So like a math professor can't just suddenly teach a class about underwater basket weaving if that's not in his job description. We think that additionally, universities limit speakers. So even though a speaker isn't necessarily representative of the university, if that, university, if that speaker is supposed to serve university goals and they, you know, there's a speaker like Steve Bannon who comes onto campus, if that speaker isn't going to empower students or create a more diverse or heterogeneous campus climate, then it is totally legitimate for either the student body or either for the university to, to disinvite that speaker. Yeah. Could you give an example of the kind of content that would be banned on the other side of the house? For example, would a professor not be allowed to say abortion is murder in their classroom? Right, so it depends on the discretion of the university, and we're not going to be on the side of dictating what is valid free speech, what is not valid free speech. But our position is that saying those limitations in a vacuum are legitimate for a university to do. So second, why absolute free speech threatens students? I'm gonna talk about a little bit about what John Macy wants to talk about, which is specifically like, what is this harmful free speech? So what does absolute free speech looks like? We think that, uh, inevitably, it creates this false equivalency of ideas, right? So if there is a person that is trying to promote white supremacist values, if we really believe in absolute free speech, then individuals are led to believe that those beliefs are just as legitimate as moral ideas and as like intellectual ideas. We think there's a difference between good moral ideas and intellectual ideas. Additionally, we don't think that prioritizing civility is going to lead to a good marketplace where people are actually listening and critiquing these ideas in a good manner. So then, who abuses this marketplace of ideas? Just like in a regular economic marketplace where there's going to be con artists and scammers, we also believe that this exists in the marketplace of ideas, specifically with individual speakers that promote white supremacy. They don't care about the free exchange of ideas. What they want at the end of the day is power to talk about why their immoral ideas <laughs> excuse me, are legitimate. So at best, you have people promoting really harmful white nationalist ideas like Milo Yiannopoulos, or at worst, you get people who are actually obtaining political power, like what we've seen with the rise of the alt-right in Europe. At the end of the day, these types of psychological harms either lead to people being threatened on campus like they don't have a voice, or it increases the legitimization of prejudice, like the Unite of Right march, or like people literally being killed for because they are threatened. At the end of the day, this debate is more about censorship, but about about consequences and drawing a line. We are proud to propose. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, on the opposition, we believe that a university benefits from a multiplicity of ideas. When we begin restricting free speech on a university, not only do we squash the multiplicity of ideas that would exist in that university, but we also have negative externalities that come from giving university administration and leadership the subjective ability to decide what kind of content can be talked about and what kind of speakers can come on to a college campus. 
Before I get into the beef of my speech, I'd like to make three points of clarification to understand what the opposition is talking about in today's debate. The first I'd like to talk about is when we're defending free speech on our side of the House, we're going to be saying we're defending free speech as it extends, uh, as defined by the Supreme Court and the state of the United States of America. That is to say, we are not defending speech that incites violence directly or incites chaos directly. We are not defending individuals shouting fire in a crowded theater. We're not defending individuals saying some ethnic group should be cleansed, right? We're going to stay far away from that, and just as the Supreme Court has defined that, that is not protected under free speech, that is something that can be uh, prosecuted. A second clarification we'd like to make is that a speaker coming on campus invited by students doesn't have to be a tacit endorsement by the university. In fact, we encourage universities, if a speaker comes on that the university disagrees with, to put out statements that say, to clarify, we are allowing this speaker here because we respect free speech, but the university administration does not endorse that idea. Therefore, we don't think administrations are tied to these kinds of speakers, right? The third point of clarification I'd like to make, uh, which is more of just a response to the government, is just think about how scary it is, the idea that they bring us that the administrations are going to have total discretion over the kind of content just like uh, not being allowed, right? We think, sure, they want to give us the obvious example of white supremacy being stopped on universities, but think of the non-obvious examples. We think this means a college like Berkeley, for instance, might ban professors from saying, abortion is murder because that is seen as offensive to women who fight for women's rights. But likewise, at the University of Notre Dame, at Franciscan University of Steubenville, for instance, Planned Parenthood is banned from coming on that campus because individuals there might find that offensive. What they are creating, essentially, is a society of individuals that don't know about the people who disagree with them, but only think that any idea that is against theirs must be thwarted and taken out of their perspective. We don't think that that's good. But let's get to the defense of that. Why is a multiplicity of ideas in the university specifically good and specifically an important thing? We're going to say it's because it builds critical thinking, right? I want to make clear here, I'm not saying that these ideas exist in some marketplace of ideas, where if we have multiplicity of ideas, the best idea will rise to the top. Instead, just engaging with individuals who disagree with you is something that builds critical thinking and makes you a better individual. Why is this? I'm going to start with a non-controversial example of like flat earth society, right? We think if a professor presents flat earth society in their scientific classroom, that there's some merit to having students think about why it is they disagree with flat earth society, right? We don't think that they should just deplatform the professor because flat earth is stupid. They should look at it and think, wow, there are actual individuals in the world that believe in this comprehensive viewpoint that the earth is flat. I disagree with that. But this leads to an existential question. Why do I disagree with that? And then they think to themselves, because my science, teacher, science teachers have told me. But then they think, why do I believe in my science teachers? It leads to a string of questions that leads you to something about reality, something about why it is that you believe things. You have to question whether or not science teachers are right. You have to question whether or not science as a discipline is merited. And you might come to the conclusion that science as a discipline is merited, but we think that's good. You should have somebody like Flat Earth force you to think about whether or not the narratives that you ha think are true are true. Let's transcend that into a more uh, controversial example. Charles Murray. Let's say Charles Murray comes on your campus and says, African Americans on average have lower IQs than whites and Ashkenazi Jews. Then you're forced to think, wow, I disagree with that, that's racist. But we don't think you should just say that's racist and deplatform him, you should think, why is it that this is wrong? And this leads you to think of comprehensive reasons, like perhaps IQ tests have implicit racism that prevents some individuals from succeeding. Perhaps a legacy of slavery has made it so African-American individuals can't ascend to the kind of white patriarchal sense of smartness that we have, right? But if you just scream off Charles Murray for being a racist, you never ask these existential questions, right? When a conservative comes up to you in the real world and says black people have a lower IQ than white people, you just call them a racist. But if you had that experience in university, you'd be able to say, ah, that's wrong. You should think about whether or not the IQ test is implicitly racist. You should think about why it is that African-American individuals don't succeed as much as Caucasian individuals. We don't, on their side of the house, these debates like boil down to essentially, you're racist from the liberal and you're a snowflake from the conservative. 
We'd rather people engage with these ideas they disagree with, ask existential questions about what it is they believe and why they believe it, and that will make them better individuals overall. Genevieve, okay, please. Okay, so we're not coddling students from critical thinking whatsoever, but we're saying that giving speakers like this a platform legitimizes their ideas. Just because you invite Steve no. Bannon to your conference mm. about like public discourse, it's like inviting Ronald McDonald to like a convention yeah. on Thank solving you. world yeah. hunger. Thanks. <laughs> Three responses. One, the Ronald McDonald example is bad. These individuals are in some cases smart and have actual opinions about the world that are merited. Second response is you're not coddling individuals, but you're creating lists that require professors not to teach specific content. We think that's specifically coddling individuals. You can't say we're presenting different viewpoints when your speech was about not presenting different viewpoints because they're offensive, right? The third response is it's like, uh, we think there is merit to bringing on a professor to have these individuals engage with them and that that will, is what will build the critical thinking. We can't just get your Marxist professor's boiled down version of, communist, uh, of, of uh, capitalism. We want real individuals who believe in capitalism defending their viewpoints, not the straw man created by your liberal or conservative professors on your side of the house. I'd like to end my speech with an appeal to good liberals in the audience. And my appeal is this. I don't want to see a world where when liberals are brought on to debates in Fox News, the liberals just say, you're a racist and you're a sexist. Because recognize that we live in a conservative country. Donald Trump is president. Brett Kavanaugh is on the Supreme Court. We need people who know how to disagree and have good reasons for disagreeing, not individuals that just say, you're sexist and you're racist. Thank you. I think the core point of the opposition case, the presumptions that underline their argumentation, are the emulation of the ultimate failure of liberal thought and the project of democracy that we have blindly believed in for the last 150 years. John says that we need to ask the existential questions. John says that we need to listen to white supremacists talk about, might I add, factually inaccurately about how African Americans have a lower IQ so that we can prove them wrong. The assumption underlying that line of argumentation is that the people who come and hijack the marketplace of ideas and the public spaces for discussion play by the same rules that we do. That is to say that they believe in facts. That is to say that they, that they use reasoning to support their assertions and evidence to back up their reasoning. That is to say that regardless of the person that you are or the place that you come from, that you have the right to engage in the same sort of speech and dialogue that we all do. People like Steve Bannon, people like individuals who believe in flat earthers do not believe in these rules. That's why we need to shut them out. And so far as they get to reject those rules and the playbooks by which we all engage in, they will never be able to encourage the freedom of thought, the essence of masquerading free speech around campuses as if that helps us engage with ideas better. You're never going to get to that place. I want to have two types of conversations in this debate. The first thing we're going to do is contest the flawed idea that all ideas are worth engaging in. And then second, we're going to tell you how absolute speech hijacks public discourse. And specifically in that point, we're going to get down to the, the essence of this debate, which is that we think if that speech harms individuals and makes them uncomfortable in their academic environment, that outweighs the right of people to speak just for the sake of being able to speak. So, on the first discussion, let's talk about why not all ideas are worth engaging in. Genevieve outlines a presumption that John completely ignored in his speech, which is that there are some debates and some area of, uh, areas of discourse that we don't have. The Seawolf debate program would never hold a de public debate on the justification of slavery. We would not replicate the Lincoln-Douglas debates. We would not have a discussion about whether or not domestic abuse is justified so that we can ponder the intellectual essence of physical violence and whether or not people deserve to be treated like human beings. And the reason for that is because people deserve dignity and people deserve to sacrifice the, 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 the liberal thought project for the sense of their personal safety. Universities do the same thing when they base their content on discrimination or when they discriminate against certain types of content. John says, oh, well, what a terrible, terrible world we would live in if we told professors what they could and could not talk about. We already do that in the status quo, right? First of all, we restrict content based on its relevance to topic area, which is the example Genevieve gave about math teachers, but moreover, 
we, we judge content based on what students present in the academic uh, like world of discourse all the time. Professors, when you submit your grades to other individuals, they ha you judge that quality based on, you judge those assignments based on the quality of the ideas and the content that are presented within those assignments. You prioritize, prioritize the use of reasoning and evidence in order to make adjudications about whether or not they are contributing to a healthy sense of academic discourse. We make those distinctions all the time. Why do some ideas deserve exclusion? I think people like Milo Yiannopoulos are a perfect example of this. When he gets up and says that trans people are confused, that they're crazy, that they're experiencing a dysphoric environment where they can't make judgments on whether or not they are experiencing reality or fiction, those are the, the sorts of things that are unsubstantiated. And when he gets up, gets up and says, well, I have a right to say this so that you can think about whether or not it's true, the, po the point of this is, is that it is bad content and we should make adjudications based on those qualities and shove them out of the area of public discourse. The importance of this is that universities have to discriminate against dangerous content to preserve the mission of academia. If you want to educate people on a level playing field, you have to exclude ideas insofar as they are not equal to all individuals. Just because you say something doesn't mean it is worth engaging with. That perfectly transitions into the second point of discussion, which is about how absolute speech hijacks, the, hijacks public discourse. It's, this, is, this is where we're really going to be opposition, but I'll give John one more chance. Transgenderism is a perfect example. You say transgenderism shouldn't be debated because it denies human dignity, mm -hmm. but recognize almost 50% of the country think that transgenderism is rooted in like a mental disease of gender dysphoria. <laughs> it's a real debate that exists in the real world. Equip people to be able to talk about it. Uh, I would contest the 50% random Gallup poll that you just invented for the sake of presenting information in this debate, which is a perfect example of what people like Milo do. They make up facts and they make up statements and reasoning in order to justify their presence in the public spaces, even though that speech discriminates against and harms the my mental and psychological well-being of other individuals. Perfect transition into my second point of discussion. What does the presence of the presence of dangerous speech specifically do? When you say that trans people are not real. That is an attack on your identity. And when we ban people from saying things like, look, your idea that you just suggested in this classroom, Genevieve, is ridiculous because you're a person of color or because you're an idiot, we don't allow those sorts of things. We have to sign student codes of conduct that, that, per, that create the parameters for the way that we're allowed to engage with other individuals. We need to do the same thing when those ideas discriminate against other individuals based on their immutable characteristics, ladies and gentlemen. When you have Yale students last year marching around their university saying no means yes and yes means anal, those are the sorts of things that we shouldn't allow so that we can ponder the intellectual consequences of whether or not consent is a justified way in which we should engage in sexual interactions. When you shut marginalized people out of public spheres, which we have historically done in the white ivory tower of academia for the last like 200 years, you disenfranchise their ability to engage in public discourse in the very first place. What it says is that it doesn't matter whether or not you have reasoning. It doesn't matter whether or not you could substantiate your opinions. If I have an opinion, it is more important than yours. And if you don't want to engage with it, leave and go to another university. What that also does is that it legitimizes speech. Because what Steve Bannon and Milo want is for it to be recognized. They don't care about the liberal thought project. They don't care whether or not you're going to engage them on the same playing field they are. They want media attention. They want to be legitimized in the same way that the professor that we're about to host on this stage is engaged. They deserve recognition because they put in the work to be recognized. Steve Bannon did not. And so far as those platforms embolden those ideas to be spread around other areas of the campus, that's how you get people who incite violence for the speakers that are talking. Last year, we had a whole bunch of posters put up on UAA that said, it's OK to be white, which implicitly affirms the, the, like, the existence and identity of white nationalists who say that, Ah, my identity is under persecution. Ah, these, pers these people of color who are trampling over my right to exist in this university. Those are the sorts of incitements towards violence and incitements towards disenfranchisement that make individuals, specifically marginalized community, feel like they aren't a part of their university. John gets to say that, oh, well, these universities don't, get to, don't have to endorse those, those, those opinions. Therefore, they get to remain abstinent towards their content. Well, when you invite these kinds of people to, to, to those uh, public discussions, you have to ask, why is it that these people deserve the same sort of recognitions as people who backed up their reasoning with evidence uh, in order to participate in the marketplace of ideas. John says you want to learn the tactics of the enemy. The enemy does not play by the same rules. And when people, people don't play by the same rules, we limit their expression and content so that they don't hurt the rest of us.
proposition's fears that the marketplace of ideas, especially on our campuses, is being hijacked by people who don't play by the rules is a valid concern. But we think the reason, the solution that they're offering today is the wrong one. Because essentially what they're doing is saying that because we think the alt-right is going to hijack the marketplace of ideas, it's better for us to hijack it in the first place. We think if we cannot have reason discourse on our campuses, which as a part of education aim to be able to allow forums for reason discourse, like the one we're all sitting in today, we think if we cannot have this reason discourse on our campuses, then that means our society cannot have them anywhere. And and that is the future that we are afraid of on our side of the house. We believe that the crux of this debate, the way in which we should evaluate, is what path is the best path to choose to ensure that universities can uphold their purpose, which is to educate their students. What we fundamentally disagree on is how we think those paths should diverge, and we believe on our side of the house that it is better to err on the side of caution and instead just choose what we've been doing in the first place. Three points in this speech. First, I'm going to talk about how universities ought to educate their students, which is a lot of where our disagreement comes from. But secondly, I'm going to talk about who censors these censors. And lastly, I'm going to talk about why our current political climate has made this into a fashionable idea whenever we've already seen that this doesn't work out before. First, into how should universities educate. The proposition believes that universities need to educate by creating a safe environment and a comfortable one for their students to learn in. And although we think that those are noble and honorable intentions, we think that the point of universities and the point of education is to be made uncomfortable, to have those challenging thoughts that my partner tells you, to question why you believe what you believe and what your values truly are. That is why whenever you graduate in four years, people don't talk about how they've learned a lot of things about specific subject matter, but about how they they've grown as a person as well. We think that educational ought to be confrontational and that is how we end up getting the best education in the long term. I'm a history student and I'm taking a class about, the gen about genocide in general and it is a very hard class to sit through. We have to watch people very tearfully describe what happened to them in places like Germany or Cambodia and it is uncomfortable to have to sit through that. But it is important to be able to understand why people behave the way they do in those situations. To understand why people that are evil or monstrous have those actions. This is the point that my partner makes, right, about Charles Murray. Yes, Charles Charles Murray is a racist, but we have to question why he believes those things, but also more so what our society's culpability, what our individual culpability is in allowing for that racism to exist. The reason why perhaps they're able to have statistics that African Americans have lower IQs is not because of who they are, but because of the way our system has treated them before in the past. The moment that we are able to label them as black versus white, as evil versus good, as monsters versus people, we think that suddenly you're no longer having that conversation, you're no longer having that confrontation that allows you to understand that part of all of us is capable of those terrible things and we need to come to terms with them and we need to understand what we can do to take responsibility to prevent this from happening in the future. They try and tell you that it's academic versus freedom of speech, but we think that they are one and the same. And whenever you try and divide them, then you don't get either. But obviously, opposition disagrees. There's a difference between being uncomfortable with opinions you disagree with and being uncomfortable with white nationalists marching around the Cuddy Quad because Milo came to campus last week. It's unclear to me why you have to invite these people to campus to understand the ideas. Why can't I read like a New York Times editorial or something? Public discourse exists outside the, the, the public spaces of the university. But it's one-sided in those environments, right? Like we can talk about how you can have conversations and discourse on Facebook, but we don't think that the conversations you're having in the comment section of the Anchorage Daily News are probably going to be very good ones because you don't end up having the actual human interaction in the long term. All right, into my second idea of who censors the censors. First proposition says that the university ought to determine what kind of bans we're going to have in place, to what degree professors need to limit what they lecture on, to what degree do trigger warnings need to be enforced. But we think that this is not a good idea because our society has already set a precedence that no individual or no group of people should be allowed to make that adjudication of what is good speech and what is not good speech because so much of it depends on the times that we live on, right? The best intentions, which is what the proposition has, go often awry, and we've seen this already happen in our past, in our society, right? So first, into this idea, right, of how universities tend to make bad choices about what kind of speech should be allowed, even in the status quo. 
And I think a really good example of this is McCarthyism in the 1950s. Communism was viewed as an idea that could be directly harmful to students, that could cause mass suffering and pain. And so because it was an idea that was unfashionable at the time, it was banned from campuses. What this meant is that you weren't having a nuanced discussion of how would communism actually fun function in our society? Is socialism a good and different alternative? Instead, it was that communists are bad, communists are monsters. There was none of that personal confrontation. There was none of that personal discovery about whether or not this was a system that we ought to have. But we think, secondly, we think that universities tend to just make choices that are fashionable at the time, that will appease the society at the time. Percy Shelley is one of the most famous English poets, and Oxford expelled him for writing about atheism. Oxford now has a, a, a memorial to him on their campus. We don't think that they are able to make good choices in the times that they exist in because they depend so much on society and so much on societal approval that they're going to make what the, the masses want, not what individuals want. This is how, whenever my partner tells you, how we live in a conservative country, and although this is a fashionable idea within liberal universities talking about maintaining liberal ideas, we have to come to terms with what this is actually going to look like. And this is where I talk about the current political climate, right? Once this precedent is set, there is no going back. There is no reversal of how our society ends up viewing free speech on campuses. What this means is that Notre Dame is completely okay and allowed by society to de-platform anyone who tries to speak on the merits of abortion, regardless of whether that student body wants to hear it or not. It means that if a sociobiology student wants to question whether there are certain things intrinsic to gender and sex, that those speech codes that say, this is racist, this is sexist, this is toxic, talking about people's identity in a way we do not believe means that you never end up having those scientific discoveries in the long term. Yes, there are going to be some hateful things that are said. Yes, people are going to have their opinions questioned and their feelings hurt, and we understand that, that can be detrimental, but we think that the hurt to our society at large is going to be much more long-lasting than simply how someone feels in a lecture. Proud to oppose. So first, I'm going to ask that our post-debate poll now be made available. In the same way that I asked at the outset of the debate for you to text in your opinion about the proposition that the future of American democracy depends upon re restricting free speech, I'm asking you to do the same thing now, that you've had a chance to hear the arguments made by the proposition and the opposition on this question, and we'll see whether or not the audience's attitude has changed. While you're doing that, I would like to invite those of you who aren't busily texting uh, to join me in a round of applause for the debaters. I hope you understand why I'm so proud of this debate team and these individual debaters. I'm also going to take an unapproved moment for promotional purposes. If you like debates, one of the projects that the Seal of Debate program is currently working on is to have a gubernatorial debate in the true sense of the word, not just a candidate forum, but an actual debate in which the candidates get a chance to develop their positions at length and to be cross-examined by one another. We're doing that next Monday night. So far, we have confirmation from three of the four major candidates. Um, and we would very much like to have you with us in the audience. The proposition for the debate on Monday night will be that uh, what role should the permanent fund dividend play in addressing Alaska's fiscal crisis? So join us there, hear the candidates' views on that position, maybe get some more information about which best represents your position and therefore deserves your vote. That'll be from 5.30 till 7 p.m. Monday, October 15th in the Wendy Williamson Auditorium. The event is free and open to the public. It's probably the case now that you've all had a chance to vote. So what I'd like to do is to ask us to go back to our pre-debate poll to refresh our memories on what the audience's attitude was before we began. What we had before the debate was 11% of those voting agreeing with the motion that we need to restrict free expression, 75% voting that we should not restrict free expression, and 13% remaining undecided until they had a chance to hear the debate. If we could now look at our post-debate poll, We'll reveal the results. We've gone from 11 to 21 percent on the side of those who would favor restrictions. We've gone from 75 to 76 percent in those opposed, and our undecideds small enough not even to matter. It looks to me like a gain uh, of, of 10 points for the proposition nets them the win in this morning's debate. So congratulations to our proposition debaters. Once again, thank you all very much for hearing us out. We hope we've added some uh, 
perspective to the conversation, and I look forward very much to hearing the rest of today's proceedings.